and together we can imagine how we might engage with curriculum change in the future. And of course, this is especially important in the context of Wales and the Welsh curriculum, which is currently undergoing similar curriculum reform with the new curriculum for Wales, which will be shaping teaching, learning assessment in schools of Wales as of next year, I believe. And we'll learn more about these developments in the next seminar, which will take place on Thursday, the 18th of March at 4 p.m. And hopefully we'll get the event right and the Zoom links right for that one. Um, today, there'll be three presentations, each lasting about 10 minutes. The first presentation was supposed to be from my colleague, Dr. Andrew Horrell, but I'm afraid that he's not well today. So I will step in and talk about some of the research that um, my colleagues and I carried out in 2010. The next presentation will be in the form of a discussion between primary school PE teacher Louise Arnold and Nicola Kars, who uh, you've just met, she introduced us today, from the University of Edinburgh. And they'll discuss how they work together to develop their understanding and enactment of the new curriculum. The final presentation is by Stuart Robertson. He's a secondary school PE teacher and head of faculty, and he'll highlight some of the processes that he engaged with as he developed his curriculum. At the end of the presentation, we're going to organise some breakout rooms and we have some topics that we'd like you to discuss. And we'd like you to come back to the room to share your discussions and ask some questions to the panel. And at the very end of the session, my colleague from Cardiff Metropolitan University, Dr. David Aldous, will tell us a bit more about the session on the 18th. So again, thank you for joining us and I hope you enjoy this session um, and hopefully we don't have any more difficulties or challenges. Okay. Okay, can we? Yes, that's fine. Okay, so this was, uh, Andrew was going to be talking. Can you all see the slides okay? Is that is that fine? So my colleague Andrew was going to talk about some of the work he did a number of years ago, working with teachers as they began to develop their new curriculum according to our curriculum here in Scotland, the Curriculum for Excellence. I won't be able to talk about this in the same way, but I can say something about the position of PE within the Curriculum for Excellence and talk about some of the research we carried out with PE teachers in the year that schools began to work with Curriculum for Excellence, and that was in 2010. Um, so Curriculum for Excellence is our national curriculum. It was published in 2004 and, in, and began to be enacted in 2010. And within this curriculum, PE sits alongside physical activity and sport and is situated within the curriculum area of health and wellbeing. Now health and wellbeing is a core curriculum area and is the responsibility of all teachers. And the fundamental aim of this area of the curriculum is to develop pupils' knowledge and understanding skills, capabilities and attributes necessary for mental, emotional, emotional, social and physical well-being now and in the future. In order to guide teachers planning for curriculum change, they were initially presented with a document that described experiences and outcomes. These are a set of first person statements that describe what should, pupils should experience and be able to do as they progress through school. Um, there are experiences and outcomes for health and well-being, the health and well-being curriculum, and experiences and outcomes for the PE curriculum. And one of the initial challenges for PE teachers was to work out how both might be integrated within their new PE curriculum. The other important point to make here is that like in Wales, teachers in Scotland were given relative autonomy to read the policy and develop their own curriculum to suit the needs of their pupils in their own local context. So the research we carried out in 2010, amongst other things, asked PE teachers to offer their perspectives on this new curriculum and to consider the changes that they might make in light of the new guidance that they were offered. It was a mixed methods project where we surveyed 88 PE teachers and interviewed 17. And some of the results here highlighted that 59% of the teachers rated their understanding of the new curriculum as less than satisfactory However, despite this lack of knowledge, 77% of teachers reported that they supported the goals, the fundamental goals of Curriculum for Excellence. And 66% of teachers believed that there was a need for change to the curriculum in Scotland at this time. Teachers were also asked if the new position of PE within health and wellbeing and the requirement to address the experiences and outcomes for both health and wellbeing and PE would change the way they organised their curriculum and 44% reported yes, they would change the curriculum, with 18% saying no and 38% unsure. 
Now, the teachers who indicated that they would change the PE curriculum stated that the following changes had actually already been made. So this was in 2010. And these were interdisciplinary work across subjects, an increased focus on literacy and numeracy, an increase in health or fitness courses with some focus on recreation, increased time for PE, improved links with outside agencies and better links to primary school. However, it is important to note that many reported uh, minimal change, little change or no change. And the teachers who reported no or little change also felt that they didn't have a good level of knowledge and understanding of the curriculum and they weren't that sure why the curriculum changed in the first place. Of interest here though, I think, is um, the increase in health or fitness courses with a focus on recreation. And this is perhaps related to the fact that when we spoke to PE teachers about the role of PE within the health and wellbeing curriculum, many of them focused on the contribution that they could make to physical wellbeing or physical fitness. And this is perhaps unsurprising given the physical nature of PE and the ubiquitous messages we receive daily about things such as childhood obesity, sedentary lifestyles and physical inactivity. No doubt PE is about movement and the body, However, perhaps such a focus on physical fitness is a rather narrow view of what it means to be healthy and not one that aligns that well with the overall objectives of health and wellbeing curriculum. Okay. In terms of being supported to make changes, many teachers felt that they required creative supportive leadership combined with guidance and feedback on individual curricular design. In particular, they emphasised the need for feedback and support on the, on the courses they were creating or had created, just to reassure them that they were interpreting the text correctly. Some teachers found the level of autonomy they were afforded difficult and expressed concern over having too much freedom. So without any moderation and feedback, they sensed that they were stumbling about in the dark a wee bit. Those teachers who were actively making changes to curriculum organisation referred to an improvement and an increase in collaborative practices throughout their whole school. So an improvement in school structure and more collaboration. Um, so schools that had embraced change either had or were developing a structure that sought to improve links between subject areas within the school, across schools, and actually were starting to develop their own professional learning communities. So to summarise, our research found that teachers in general agreed that there was a need for change, but many of them lacked knowledge and confidence in reading the curriculum and making any radical changes. Many of the changes that, there were, that were made were simply minor tweaks to existing curriculum. Those teachers who did seem to engage more with change spoke about support structure with their school that facilitated collaboration and professional learning both within and across schools. And this seemed to help them to interpret the curriculum and develop their ideas for change. Um, so I think that the key issues here are related to, related to the challenges uh, that teachers face were both in terms of reading the curriculum and having this autonomy to enact the curriculum. And now I think this message seems to have reached the Scottish Government to some extent, who in 2014 published further curriculum guidance for teachers in the form of a document called significant aspects of learning, or SALS as they're known here. These are specific areas of learning in PE and include physical competencies, cognitive skills, physical fitness and personal qualities. And interestingly, this reflects a broader, broader conception of both PE and health, and in many ways guides teachers away from viewing PE as being synonymous with physical health. Then in 2017, the benchmarks for PE were published this is an extensive list of knowledge, skills, competencies that pupils should be able to know and do as they progress through school. And they're explicitly aligned with the SALS, thus once again ensuring a broader conceptualization of both PE and health. So as you can see, the landscape has changed over the last 10 years and it is still changing. But I can honestly say that although te teachers perhaps struggled at the start with lack of guidance, lack of knowledge, lack of confidence, the profession of a whole now have an excellent grasp of the curriculum and in many many P departments around the country they do look very different now to the to, compared to uh, how they looked 10 years ago. It's been a challenging journey for them and in the presentations that follow this one you'll get an idea of just some of the challenges that were experienced firsthand both in the context of primary schools and the secondary schools. 
So I'd like to now hand you over to Louise and Nicola, who will share their curriculum development experiences in the primary school context. So I'll just stop sharing my screen and then Nicola and Louise can take over. Hi, Shirley. Thank you. Um, so Louise and I um, have worked together for a long time. We were teaching together at one point and then um, I started working for the university and we continued to work together. We've had lots of conversations over time about curriculum for excellence. We were working together when it was introduced and we've worked with it through. So I'm just going to pose some questions to Louise, who's going to talk about her experiences as a primary school teacher of working with curriculum for excellence and the changes that came in. So Louise, what we're going to look at first is looking at um, when Curriculum for Excellence was first introduced in 2009. Can you tell me about your context at that time and what you were thinking about it? Yeah, 2009, quite a long time ago now. Um, at that time, I was working as a class teacher and also as a PE teacher within the same uh, primary school. And in my role as a PE teacher, um, I had complete um, autonomy over how I was designing my curriculum um, and my approaches to teaching. As a class teacher, it was slightly different being part of set year groups um, in a large primary school. I was also completing my postgraduate at that time in developmental PE at Edinburgh University which was great being part of something like that at that time because I was very aware of the 2004 PE review in the lead up to um, Curriculum for Excellence, so I had a good understanding. So um, I was really excited at the time, having worked with 5 to 14, which was the, the previous curriculum, um, because now, as Shirley had touched on, PE had a new place. It, it, it had an exciting platform. It had gone from expressive arts into health and wellbeing, where it now sat alongside but separate from physical activity and sports. So it really put the spotlight on physical education. It was the only subject within the Scottish curriculum that there was a stipulation that there had to be two hours of PE a week for um, every student across Scotland. Um, and there was a massive emphasis um, on quality. It uses the term quality PE. Um, it was also an opportunity to, to develop real professionalism um, because like the, the Welsh curriculum, um, it, it's, it's a bottom-up approach. It's not about politicians um, driving the curriculum. And this, um, as I saw at the time, gave us a great opportunity to develop a curriculum that was re relevant to us within our local community and um, to give us a meaningful context. So we touched on there, I'd worked with Nicola as a, as a class teacher and also um, when she was working with her PhD, uh, um, studying for her PhD, I was able to work alongside her. Um, I was still part of the university um, and as I was saying before, I had no one peering down over my shoulder at school telling me what to do and how I should do. Of course, I had PE specialists that we met with regularly within our region, but that was about, at the early stages, it was just very much about feeling our way. Whereas I felt that my confidence grew massively um, through these connections with the uni and Nicola um, and allowed me an opportunity to be very creative and experiment with my curriculum um, and how I was teaching my, um, my pedagogy. Um, there was one sort of thing that, that's, that hung over all of us, I think, at the time, and that was the issue of assessment. We felt very much at a loose end with that. We didn't know where we were going with that at the time. Yeah, thanks, Louise. And I remember you saying at the time, you know, because of the PE background you were doing and the 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 course, the master's level of learning you were on, that really helped you engage in dialogue about curriculum for excellence, but you didn't feel it was quite the same within your school context and with colleagues that that wasn't going on in the same way. So it's interesting to hear about, you know, what you thought at the start. And now we're over, you know, over 10 years later, we're still working with Curriculum for Excellence. It's developed over time. Do you want us to tell us a little bit more about how you're working with it now and the journey to where you are now with it? Yeah, so it was interesting because one of the things that stuck in my head way back then was this this, this um, 
aim that they were going to declutter the curriculum because five, five to 14 was very messy. Um, however, unfortunately, I feel now we're kind of back in that situation where um, there's too much. We've got subjects vying for their position within the curriculum. And a reflection of that downside is the fact that the interdisciplinary learning, which Shirley spoke about with our second JP colleagues, they were talking about working across departments. Certainly the feel in my context is that that's not happening to the degree we'd hoped. And there's a lot of reasons behind that. Um, and now in the primary, um, the primary school, it's taken on almost a tokenistic um, place um, and sits usually around topics. Um, so, um, yeah, it's almost like there's too many initiatives and it was making it sort of too messy. Significant, significant aspects of learning, God, there's lots of uh, things to put my teeth back in. Coming in in 2014 was, was really what we needed. And exactly what Shirley said at the start, it gave us a bit of clarity. And for me, um, as a practitioner, it made sense because I have a developmental approach to physical education and I'd come from the class. I knew that you couldn't separate the cognitive from the social or emotional from the, the fitness and the physical competent physical competencies. So I was I was delighted to see this happening. Um, and again at this point, my professional um, um, development had, had moved on a bit. I was I was had a foot, I was involved a little bit with Education Scotland. But I'd also taken on a professional inquiry project within my school into higher order thinking skills. So I was working with class teachers and primary PE specialists with that higher order thinking skills. So again, having the cognitive domains, it gave that a fantastic place to um, broaden my horizons and push forward the importance of the thinking aspect. I was still working with the university and again, I cannot emphasize the importance of professional dialogue, working alongside people, having that safety net, um, because we all have this fear as human beings about getting it wrong. And there was, you know, thinking back, there was a significant amount of fear. Um, so then the benchmarks um, coming in 2017, I think I was so comfortable with, with working with the cells that there was a bit of me went, oh, benchmarks, really, you know, and the benchmarks offered us these specific statements, which, you know, were, were put in place to, do, to assist our professional judgment when it comes to assessing. So it's given us more. And that's fine, I think, when you're a, a specialist of, uh, of physical education. <laughs> Thanks, Louise. So that brings us into thinking about what would you say then are the key benefits um, that you've seen for, from Curriculum for Excellence and, and, what are the potent, uh, and what are the limitations? Well, for me, in my context, definitely the fact that it was non-prescriptive and it gave me freedom to choose different contexts for learning, that ability to make my own decisions and to be creative in my practices. Um, and a move away from that sort of sports specific traditional model into more of a lifelong learning perspective, incorporating health and, you know, the context of health and well-being. Um, however, I've touched on this, although I felt I had or have um, immense freedom, I don't necessarily think that that's the case at the moment for class teachers. Um, although I del deliver a, the bulk of physical education in the school, there's still a number of teachers that have either all their PE to deliver themselves or an hour of their PE. And what I'm finding with them is that they'll come to me, we'll work together, but they do tend to move towards um, more of an activity based curriculum that is still sort of maybe more um, based along the grounds of sport, you know. Um, the, the, the sport model um, and I wonder if that's about um, the sheer volume of documentation and the fact that it's hard for them to keep up with the policies within physical education and health and well-being. So I spoke earlier about using the benchmarks. Um, they're great and I use them probably in quite a broad way. They are my main go-to, the significant aspects of learning benchmarks are my main go-to for assessment. 
but I still use them in a bit of a cherry picking way. I think it says clearly in the document, it should not be about a tick box. Oh, we've covered that because learners don't work that way. So I cherry pick at times. So it's good to have that tool. It's good to understand that and to be able to, um, cherry, to cherry pick. And funnily enough, in reflecting about all of this, a lot of the um, benchmarks I do use, I can see the link far stronger now with ex um, experiences and outcomes of the 2009 document than I perhaps did before, but I was just reflecting on this over the last couple of weeks. I feel that the separation of sport from phys uh, sport physical activity has allowed me to um, justify competition. So although I'm teaching within the school in this core way, in a very holistic way, there's still a place for competition and sport and uh, physical activity. So I'm very lucky the region that we live in, there's a lot of opportunities. My school really says no to me. So my kids are at every competition there is. It also offers me the freedom to strengthen the, if you like, the local context. I've been able to use the relationships I've built up over the years with active schools. Um, we've got sports development officers in East Lothian, local clubs, and work closely with the Cluster High School and my ex-pupils, the young sports leaders, the PE teachers of the future, um, and very importantly, the parents of the children that I work with. So I feel that that freedom has allowed me to make really strong community connections, which can only enhance a curriculum and, and hopefully make it connected and current and meaningful to the children um, that, I, that, I work, that I work with. Um, yeah. Thanks, so, Louise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think that highlights, I mean, what this reflects the discussions that we had um, and what we were saying about the idea of the curriculum and, and what was a key for you was understanding the policy, having the professional dialogue, um, the professional development that you did, because it helped you. And we were talking about how remembering that curriculum for excellence is just guidelines and that the uh, that curriculum is actually a kind of ongoing process that's live, that's long term, that's iterative. Um, and I think that's what you've captured in your discussion and how you've worked with it and that teachers are central to that. But we were saying that we don't always feel that's always been recognised in the policy. And you can see that with the the kind of lots of documents that were, that were shared over and, you know, with everything building on each other. So, uh, yeah, that was just the key messages we took from it. So thanks, Louise. Thanks, Shirley. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. That, so um, thanks for that. So that was um, Louise's experience in the primary context. We're now going to hand over to Stuart, Stuart Robertson, who's a PE teacher here in, in Edinburgh, and he's going to talk a little bit about his experiences. Stuart, can you share your slides or do you want me to? Let's see if I can do it. Uh, no, actually, if you've got them there, that would be easier. Yeah, OK. So. Yeah. Um, just, I suppose, what you're going to hear from me probably is a little bit of... Uh, a, a lot of similar stories uh, to the ones that Louise and Nicola just talked about there as well. Um, I'm going to start just by looking through, um, if we go on the next one, and we'll just go straight on there. And we'll start, uh, I'll start by just talking through the kind of concept when we started delivering this or started creating this curriculum in 2009. Um, and some of the sort of thought processes that we had, I'll talk a little bit around the um, the sort of initial experiences and where we're at now. I think at the start, I heard when we were trying to develop this curriculum, one of the things that kept coming back was that um, was that people sat in one of two camps. They either said that, no, it's just the same, it's everything that you're already doing, or people saying it's, it's about a, a new start, doing something completely different. Um, and actually, I think there's actually a little bit of truth in both there. I think good teaching was good teaching, but I thought it was possibly more about a bit of a change in perspective. Um, just looking at um, looking at it from a different a different way. One of the opportunities there was, that, as uh, Louise mentioned earlier, it put health and well-being as a cornerstone of the curriculum. It put it right in there and put it right up front and centre. I think some of the fears that some people had at that point in time was that actual physical education might be sort of sidelined or watered down in some 
uh, to some extent uh, into a sort of broader thing. And the breadth was quite overwhelming. The breadth of uh, experiences that were sort of listed in detail there. Um, at the at the time of um, developing and implementing this qualification, we had no uh, national qualification framework, so we didn't know what we were working towards in terms of uh, certificated exams. Um, is everyone still there? Are there? I see a few things. Yeah, yeah. I'm working. Okay, Shirley's just lost. Shirley's on Stuart, so that's she's fine. not. So no, no slides just now. That's Sorry. Fine. That's okay. No <laughs> Bad behaviour. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so at, at the time of development, we didn't know what we were working towards in terms of the national qualifications. And in some ways, that was really difficult. But in some ways, it meant that we weren't sort of hamstrung by trying to teach to the exam or to the test. So it gave us that sort of freedom, that creative freedom, if you saw it in that manner. And that was quite interesting and, and quite uh, liberating, I think, so, certainly from my perspective. Um, I think some departments and some people saw it as an opportunity to try and fit their current curriculum into the rationale that was put out there um, as something that, um, yeah. And I suppose that was kind of almost like through a, a minimum workload thing. Um, or not having the grasp of what they're doing. So they just wanted to try and fit that in there. The experience that we had was different. We decided to start and work from the bottom up, again, as Louise mentioned earlier. So we started by looking at the experiences and outcomes and working backwards, looking at the pedagogies we wanted to deliver, to use to deliver those wider experiences um, and we wanted to embrace this idea of where personalization and choice and making the experience and the learner's experience fit the individual as opposed to making the individual fit the curriculum. So we saw all that as a, a really interesting um, option for us. Um, I won't go over the, uh, every, every element of it, but essentially what we did with our curriculum was we looked at... Um, in the second year of high school, giving pupils the opportunity to choose a course of action, a, a course of activities, as opposed to it being predefined. So they had some element of choice in there. Um, we changed our teaching methodologies. We looked at incorporating aspects that probably historically we didn't deliver or we didn't explicitly deliver in PE, where we looked at team working, social skills, communication, uh, building confidence. So we, we took the whole broad health and wellbeing curriculum and tried to base our teaching experience around that. Um, what we found within a couple of years, Shirley uh, did lots of research with our pupils and sort of two or three years in, we found that one of the things that was really interesting was that a lot of our um, interpretations of the curriculum were not matched by the pupils uh, views or experiences so one of those was one of the fears was always about the fact that PE would be sidelined and we'd get into a sort of very broad health and well-being type experience that diluted the skills somewhat but what came back from our research was actually the skills-based competence was really important for kids really important for the pupils um, and so that was something that we had to sort of reintroduce almost because we'd gone a little bit too broad with it and the pupils really wanted to have that 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 skill development uh, focus what was also interesting with pupils perception of their competence dropped as they moved from primary through s1 s2 um in in the high school even though their performance improved their perception of competence dropped the I suppose the biggest change for us was this idea about changing our curriculum and making it fit the, um, the, the sort of choices and giving kids the opportunity, giving pupils the opportunity to build social um, experiences around it. And um, what, what was interesting from the research that was done there was that pupils did want choice. They found it really important, but it wasn't the choice that we thought. They wanted choices on partners that they worked with, the tasks that they did, 
but not activities. They said that activities really were almost unimportant um, to what they did. And in actual fact, they didn't mind doing uh, activities that were maybe that they may be perceived as gender stereotyped um, in the opposite way, as long as they were doing it with people that they felt comfortable with, they felt safe. So it kind of built naturally into that sort of socialised environment. Um, the other thing that, was, that came out that was really important was that pupils wanted to be challenged. Anything that was too easy or too difficult was off-putting. And they wanted time to develop. So again, we looked at a curriculum and I suppose it was for us at that point, it was a very traditional model for us, which was sort of six week blocks of activity. But pupils told us that that was one of their big frustrations was that as they got to the end of a block of activity, they started to feel that they were getting somewhere, they were getting the challenge, they understood what they were trying to achieve and we moved them on to something else and they, and they sort of didn't like that at all. So that was kind of the first few years experience. From then on, it's very much for us still been a, a, a job of tweaking and adapting our curriculum as we've gone through it. Now we have been through the cycle a few times. We've seen the national qualifications come out and been adapted and changed a couple of times over already. Um, but there are still, so there's still massive challenges for us for de delivering curriculum for excellence, particularly in the in the sort of junior phase and the, the broad general education is really challenging for us. And I think we're now at the point of the cycle where we've got to go back and almost look at that whole experience again, now that we have the experience of a couple of cycles through. Some of the challenges that, that I'm still facing is this idea that Louise touched on as well, is this assessment of levels. How to make a judgment on an assess on a pupil's level of performance in the curriculum is really difficult. We've got different contexts. We've got movement skills and competencies, their cooperation and competing. We've got their physical fitness and uh, confidence and personal qualities. So how you come to bring that together to make one sort of judgment on a level is really difficult. And I think that's exacerbated in PE when we do four or five or six different activities, how you uh, bottom out a score, uh, a, a robust, a genuinely important and a genuinely accurate um, level for that pupil when they're doing swimming one week and badminton another and basketball and hockey is really challenging. And I don't know if I've necessarily got the answer to that yet, but that's definitely a large part of what we do because assessment should be um, something that drives what we do, not a, a tick box exercise, again, as Louise said at the start there. Um, one of the things that's, that is really challenging and we have found over the, the course of the first few years or the first five, six years was that you can't be all things to all people. And what we quickly reverted to from our original ideas, or not reverted to, but we, we adapted, was this idea that, that actually the skills are important. Movement skills are really important. And as physical education, in terms of physical education, the, the skills become the focus of our lesson, where at the start, we try to incorporate lots of other elements into our teaching. I think the health and well-being aspect that goes around and joins up our physical education um, experience is around the ethos and the way that we deliver it and the situations that we create um, being constant throughout, although we don't always make that explicit. We're not always explicitly saying today we're looking at uh, socialising or communication. But what we do is we might refer to that at the end of the lesson or at appropriate points. There is still this debate a little bit uh, in general about physical education or health and well-being. And I think it's really important that there's a place for both. Both are really, really important. Uh, but they are discreet at, at times. We have to have physical education and we have to have health and well-being. And there is lots of crossover between the two. But we need to acknowledge the part that each plays in each other. Um, overall, I think um, the curriculum has been a success. I think now in the last four or five years, our focus has been largely on our senior phase and on our qualifications and getting that element right. And I think the, the, 
the sort of lasting message and, and where our improvement planning cycle is just now is that we now see what the end goal is and it now lets us know how we need to enact the broad general education of curriculum for excellence in order to get that successful learners at the other end. Um, and so that's really where our big piece of work is now. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. That was really interesting and a nice follow on from uh, Louise there as well. Shirley, are you still there? I don't know if Shirley's left again. <laughs> so, Shirley left midway. Oh, yes, I am. Oh, no, you're back. You're yeah. here. <laughs> Zoom decided to kick me out. Thanks, Shirley. No, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Hi, Shirley. Okay, I think I'm going to need to take over because I think Shirley's having technical difficulties. Um, so what we're going to do there is we're going to say thank you to Louise and to Stuart for talking to us around um, the primary context and the secondary context and Shirley who set it up. Now, because of the technical difficulties we, we have had today and looking at the time, we had hoped to go into breakout rooms, but what I think we'll actually do is just move into a discussion now. So we'll give you some time though just to have a think about questions you might want to ask, points you would want to raise. Um, and how we'll do that is that we'll do that by um, you can raise your hand so you can do that um, you can do that through Zoom if you go to your uh, go to your you can find and you can raise your hand or you can give me a wave and I'll keep a, an eye out for people or you can put your question in the chat and what we normally do is we go between the chat and the and people raising their hand to ask a question on the floor. Um, OK, so I'll give you a chance just to have a think and a reflect. And then if anybody's got any questions, please just put it in the chat or raise your hand um, to start our discussion off. David, Anna, while people are thinking, is there anything, any points you want to raise as a starting thought or question from a Welsh perspective? Yeah, perhaps Nicola will come in there. Just want to think, um, bearing in mind that we're going through um, the curriculum reform now in Wales, what tips might you have or what learning could you give perhaps to the PE teachers from Wales who are now moving from a PE-based curriculum to a health and wellbeing-based curriculum? Perhaps Louise or, or, or Stu might come in there. I would just say that um, I, I think it's important. The people that have probably, I think, delivered best on the curriculum up here are the people who have started with a very open mind. I think, I mean, it, it stands to reason, but the people who are trying to uh, lever uh, the curriculum they're currently delivering into a, a new model really haven't changed very much and you know that whole thing you know they've got the same results and the same things are same experiences that they had before so having an open mind with that but also not trying to take on too much you know actually looking at what your good practice is and keeping that and actually looking at where there are natural links with health and well-being is really important and I think maybe that's kind of where we maybe got it a little bit wrong at the start was we actually went too much the other extreme in terms of we tried to do everything from scratch and we tried to do almost everything all at once so I think just just bearing in mind what good pedagogy looks like what all the the positives are for physical education and, and the delivery in the context that you deliver it but then looking to see where there are links that that would enhance that that experience for them thanks Stuart Louise anything you want to come in with there yeah, and I mean, obviously, a, a strong theme within what I was saying is the importance of um, your own learning communities and supporting one another and not being too, uh, you said, openness there, Stuart, just, yeah, giving it a go, um, moving with it, not being scared to make mistakes. And I noticed that within your documentation, there's also an element of you creating your own assessment, which was different to ours. So you'll be working with the the assessment and the curriculum and you know in that 
that cyclical way, which is I would say is a is a positive. Um, yeah, because fear was a big thing, and I mean, just in the whole way we deal with change, some people dug their heels in. Um, yeah, openness and the ability to talk and support one another through it, and it, it isn't easy but it's looking at the positives and being able to celebrate the successes that you've had. And also as well, Stuart mentioned talking to your young people. And I think that's hard sometimes because they see the world. I don't know if you find this with high school students, Stuart, but they see it in a very traditional way. So sometimes we're trying to move in a direction and what they're giving us back, we're kind of going, oh, we're failing with that. But their fun, their enjoyment, their connection is, is a massive guide to, to how you're doing as well. That's the litmus test. Thanks, Louise. And I'm just going to pick up from the chat there. Yeah, thanks, David. You put in the point there about keeping open-minded in curriculum development and exploring the possibilities for PE aligning with health and well-being. And I think that was the shift that happened for us when Curriculum for Excellence came in with the move of the positioning of physical education and is still ongoing and looking at how physical education aligns, how, how they work together. I'm now looking at some questions in the chat, so I'm going to put some of these forwards. I've got one um, from Susie to Stuart asking for clarification. Um, when you said you saw an end goal for which to develop your curriculum towards, do you mean the certificate courses? Because um, Susie's wondering if therefore our, uh, our curriculum should be devised with the structure of these courses in mind. I don't know, it's, it's the whole chicken and egg situation, isn't it? Because actually, I think one of the things that was really beneficial for us in the first instance was that we didn't look or we didn't teach to the test. So because we didn't know what the, and in our case, the National Five and Higher Qualifications were going to look like, we couldn't make our BGE a sort of watered down version of that that worked towards that. So actually, I think that was really positive. But nevertheless, when you get to that end point, you start to see if there are gaps in what you've done. So if I can take a sort of really practical example of that, our uptake in our um, sort of choice of courses is really high. But one of the things we're finding now is that we have more and more pupils who are choosing to do certificated PE as one of their academic subjects that maybe historically they haven't engaged with PE sort of um, that often or don't do sports out of school. Now that's brilliant. That tells us that our BG is doing something right in terms of it's getting them really engaged. However, when we got to the national qualifications, one of the things we then established was some of these pupils are perfectly, perfectly good sort of in terms of their literacy levels. They can cope with the academic side of it. But actually we've now got a group of pupils that we never used to have before whose physical skill, physical movement skills weren't really good enough to be able to back that up. So we had to go back then and look at that and go, we need to actually add in more challenge and more um, more physical movement skills practices in to support these kids to get this qualification. So it, it is chicken and egg. It's difficult because that first few years, you're, you're coming into that National 5 qualification and you're not really sure if those three years before that, that you prepared your kids appropriately for, their, um, for that uh, qualification. But it's it allows you to build an experience that's the right experience, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Yeah, I think you've captured, I think it's the difficulties, and Louise said with assessment was the key difficulty for Curriculum for Excellence, and, and it still is, and the problem with the examinations, and then I think P's done actually very well with broad general education, but then the examinations adds that layer of complication around assessment. So, yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to go to... A Primary question, a question related to primary now um, from Elspeth. So, um, Louise, just from a primary perspective, Elspeth asking, is there any tips for supporting pupils, teachers and leadership teams in understanding that a move away from a sports-based curriculum is beneficial? Louise, you need to unmute. Yeah. I just realised that it's quite good to have a mute button on me sometimes though. Yeah, Elspeth, um, it's, I'm seeing more and more fundamental core PE stuff coming out in um, 
some of the the clubs now um, um, in Scotland, I'm seeing more um, move towards these concepts, these basic concepts early on. So sometimes for your more elite um, athletes, it's asking them what they're doing in training and highlighting where they're going and why are they spending half an hour each session on footwork skills? Stuart, jump in here as well. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, um, having this constant discussion about the benefit. And that's where, again, we were lucky to have the, the sales, the significant aspects of learning. So it was a big message to leadership a big message to class teachers and to the pupils. So every time we're in the gym hall, we've got we've got big whiteboards with the sales written on them. They're little, some of mine are really small. So I'll say, which part of the pie is that? Then they'll go, oh, well, we're thinking more today. Um, but today's been more about uh, movement. So uh, yeah, and how, I don't know how you're gonna get there, but to adopt systems, visual things, uh, big messages. Um, that your pupils can link into, that yeah. management can link into. I think as well, Louise, from a primary perspective for us, and you were doing the developmental physical education course at the time, was the emphasis on the holistic, wasn't it? The social, emotional, cognitive, physical, um, and about more pedagogical approaches, like a more guided discovery approach to allow the pupils to discover movement and move in different ways. Um, and um, give them a bit more freedom around that um, and taking ownership of their learning um, and still using what the, the pupils would see as sports but um, adapting them so making the game more appropriate for primary age children using things like I know Louise and I used a lot of playground style games that could be developed that are linked to a sport and the children could see that connection but making it more developmentally appropriate for them. Yeah I mean approaches like um, um, student design games, yeah. uh, sport education, um, looking at thinking games for understanding um, and looking at your your sports in a generic way so bringing in your footballers bringing in your basketball players to a game of hockey and making the comparisons and giving them a place and building their confidence across the different contexts and as Stuart said as well definitely allowing them this opportunity to um, seek expertise with certain movements and or certain sports if that's where you're going with it at a given time. Thanks, Louise. Uh, there's so much more we could say, isn't there? Going back to the chat and the questions, I'm just going to pick up one from Claire Walsh about um, going back to you, Stuart, in this one. She was saying that she found your point that health and well-being is more of a teaching philosophy in your school PE department. So what does that look like in practice? She's asking. Well, I think it could take a number of uh, different uh, guises over the course of say a year's experience in PE some of those are some of those might be very um, sort of structured and carefully thought out so for example you're teaching a block of basketball you're thinking about your pedagogies and you're, I, again we've gone to the point where we're focused we are actually much more back focused on what are the movement skills that require the movement patterns are required to be successful in basketball what sort of decisions you need to make to be successful in basketball However, in that particular context, what we might do is look at some sort of form of the sport education model, which then builds in some of the health and well-being experiences when taken on different roles, roles of leaders. And while we wouldn't necessarily make an explicit focus in every lesson, we would then talk about that and talk about what the experiences are. It would then also look like things like restorative approaches using that type of language on a daily basis or growth mindset language on a daily basis. So where, is the, where we're praising kids' effort, and we're encouraging challenge and we're encouraging them to fail and make mistakes and telling them that's part of the journey and the process. All of that would be what I would, I would now see as being my delivery of health and well-being in a broader context while I'm still trying to get them to build, perform an overhead clear effectively in a game of badminton and, uh, a volleyball spike the restorative approaches then would be about when you have conflict um, if you look at something like a game of basketball football or rugby one of the great things about it is that it creates conflict it creates winners it creates losers 
So therefore, health and well-being then comes about you then tackling the way in which people deal with those situations. So that would be what it would look like to me in a curriculum. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks for, for expanding on that. The next question I'm going to ask is to you both, actually. And I like this one. It's from Lauren. She said, if you could go back to 2008, or we know the lead into Curriculum for Excellence was quite long, but slightly before that in Scotland, what do you think you would, what do you think would have been most helpful to help teachers prepare? So thinking back on it now. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure if it would be the most helpful thing for me to prepare. I think definitely my experience as I've gone through sort of 10, 12 years of this has been decluttering. It's actually been focusing on less, but, but making the quality better. Um, and I think, I, I, I think that's, that's the kind of key message that, that I would sort of tell myself if I went back there is, is stop trying to do everything all at once pick something that's really important how do you deliver that and then look for the natural links um, in terms of actual supports um, I suppose along the lines of, of what Louise said you know when they're actually looking at things like significant aspects of learning and benchmarks and telling you how you can assess these things having that at the start would have been really helpful so you could then work back from that whereas what we had was a list of experiences um, with no real measurement of how you would judge that at the start. So it was difficult to know how to pitch that. So I think actually the, the, the benchmarks and the, uh, the measurements, the assessment measurements that you're going to use, having that at the start would be really useful, not in the sense of national qualifications or anything, but in terms of how you assess levels. Thanks, Stuart. Louise, anything else from you there? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... I suppose it's the whole purpose and meaning of why you're bringing it in. Uh, we were um, inspected just before or around about the time that Curriculum for Excellence was coming in. And I remember just being there, asked the question, how are you preparing your, you know, the one that we've been talking about for years in education, but how are you preparing your pupils for, tw for 20 years down the line when we don't know what 20 years down the lines? We've got no comprehension of what it's going to look like. And for me, that was a, that made me go, right, okay, what are we doing? What are the important things in a child's education? And that then boils down to your health. It boils down to empathy, cooperation, dealing with competition, conflict resolution, um, communication, and it's all there within PE. So I think making it meaningful and purposeful um, together for your school. But yeah. I've noticed as well, and I've forgotten the name for them when I was looking at your learning intention things, um, they're very vague as well. And there's, there's, you've not got much to deal with. So I know you've got a big job in your hands. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Stuart. And just linking into that, I'm just picking up on a question from Dylan talking about saying it was interesting to hear about how you interpreted and enacted a broad curriculum where you had a level of freedom and how you approached it. And this links into the previous question about, you know, key ingredients to interpreting a curriculum and making it meaningful. Um, and I'm just thinking actually myself, Louise, in the discussions we had and the work that we've done together, I think key to that for me would be professional development and practitioner inquiry. Um, and I think that comes out from what Stuart was saying as well, of being able to engage in practitioner research and the, the work that you've done with universities and looking at the responses of the children, responses of teacher, how, teachers, how the curriculum is being developed. Um, that was what I was thinking. Anything else, Stuart, Louise, you want to add in there about the sort of key ingredients to interpreting the curriculum and making it meaningful? Um, my, my only addition to that would be, and it kind of relates to one of the other questions is in the chat there about, you know, what about having coaches delivering, is that I suppose one of the concepts I've got to bear in mind is is keeping the learner at the centre of it all. But um, if we have a class of 30 pupils doing, I don't know, badminton, something like that, um, we're not going to get 30 kids that are going to carry on and do badminton. So it's about looking at what the learning is. The, what, are, what is the benefit to the majority of our children that we're teaching? And if we're teaching them how to move correctly, how to 
you know, how to prepare for a shot, how to evaluate their performance, how to work with other people, how, you know, the, those are skills that, they're, that are going to be useful for them, whether they become, they become badminton players or rugby players or footballers or whatever. Um, so I think, I think that becomes important as well. It's just, it, it's thinking about the learners and thinking about what the, what the value is for them beyond the gym and beyond that particular activity. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Anything else, Louise, you want to add? I think we, um, Avalon, I can only speak for myself, the kids come out with absolute corkers. And I think we often undervalue their skills, their knowledge and what they can bring to a class. So I'd say definitely tapping into them more. And that brings in, as you, you're talking about choice and how we interpreted personalisation and choice early on, they can make one of your planned lessons, their lesson very quickly by bringing in their world, their thoughts, um, their design to that situation. So I think in terms of, yeah, it's about how we, we pull them in. Dylan, do you want to just come in? Do you want to come in on that there? Yeah, thanks, Nick, and thanks, Louise and Stuart. Um, I'm just picking up on both your comments there, and thanks for answering my question. Um, and picking up what Nick was talking there about practitioner research or, or and having these relationships, like you're dealing with Nicola, who might be in a teacher education university, you're talking to other PE teachers, and I presume there's a lot of pre-service teachers on this call. Can you uh, speak to like the importance of getting involved in these community of learners or get involved in practitioner research for your enactment and your interpretation and translation of the curriculum and making it meaningful for your students? Um, yeah, I mean, from our perspective, on what we do with, with that in terms of initial teacher education is, we emphasize it from the start of our programs, the um, engagement and research and practitioner inquiry that students are doing. And we very much set up heading towards the kind of fourth year traditional dissertation, setting that very much up more as a practitioner inquiry and encouraging our students when they're in the school context to be asking questions, reflecting um, and thinking about what that's telling them in their, in their school context. So we really encourage them to engage with that from the start. Then in the Scottish context, that is continued because through when the students leave the university, they go into what's called their induction year, which is overseen by the General Teaching Council for Scotland, and they very much also emphasise practitioner inquiry. And in most cases, in most local authorities, um, teachers in their induction year will be asked to do a practitioner inquiry as part of that and engage in practitioner inquiry. Um, so we see that kind of working through our initial teacher education and then work that we do within school context and promoting practitioner inquiry through also General Teaching Council for Scotland as well. Stuart, Louise, anything else you want to add there or? No, uh, not, not particularly I want to add anything on that, that topic. Um, and again, I'm just looking through the chat there, um, but I think the the practitioner inquiry that I was involved in, the research we involved in with sort of Shirley in particular over the course of, it's probably over the course of sort of seven, eight years, has undoubtedly been the thing that has shaped our curriculum most after that initial uh, development. Thanks, Donna. Good question. I'm going to go back to a question now because there's a couple of points. That, oh, sorry, Louise, did you want to come in there? Uh, no, no, go for it. It's okay. It's all right. No, please do, please do, because I know you've done lots and lesson study and various things. Do you want to say? No, I suppose it's, again, it's just posing this thing. We've been lucky that we've had that <laughs> almost career-long profession, professional engagement with Edinburgh University. And I think when, and sometimes we, I get involved with things I don't necessarily at the start go, oh God, I don't know if I want to do that, but I know it's going to do me good. And I suppose it's, it's just knowing our our place within our profession and valuing that and being able to seek people out that will have more knowledge and experience than our than than ourselves and, and just to, as you said it keep asking questions we encourage it in our learners I think if we could enact what we tell our kids we would we would do so much better yeah thanks Louise um, I'm just going to finish up with a question linking back to um, ideas about this kind of community and because um, there's a couple of people that have asked about this kind of the linkage um, through Curriculum for Excellence to community links, um, sports clubs, uh, these kinds of aspects talking about active schools. Um, so just getting your take on that and I think just before I move to you, 
to you both. I think one of the key aspects for curriculum for excellence, which was really strong, was the separation within the curriculum documentation of physical education, physical activity and sport. So recognised them, but helped so that they didn't become conflated and so we could see them and value them. And, um, and the other aspect of that that was key was our active schools network, which supports physical education in schools, but doesn't take over for, from it. And particularly in a primary context, I know that there are issues in England and in other um, countries with the kind of outsourcing of primary PE. And we haven't experienced that to the same extent in Scotland because it's been mainly delivered by specialist teachers or generalist class teachers. And the work that's been done with coaches or with active schools has been done very much in partnership and not taking over. Um, Stuart, Louise, do you want to add anything more on that about um, your kind of experiences and the links between stakeholders in and, and sport and physical activity? I suppose for me, it was just looking at what I had, and I mentioned this in what I said earlier, looking at what I had on my doorstep um, to support what I was doing and to support what the children were doing. And I know in our discussions, Nicola, you spoke about as a young learner and you said that the PE curriculum at your high school didn't reflect what you, you as an individual at all. And that resonates with me. So I think here there's a... Obviously, just now everything's been blown out of the water with COVID, but um, active schools are often asking what they can do. The um, sport, the leaders in the community, you know, they'll, they'll maybe come to me and say, we, we would like more numbers in hockey or we would like more numbers. And it's like, well, getting them to come in to speak to the children, just again, basic communication when the clubs are making this within Curriculum for Excellence, it highlights the fact that I can access uh, clubs and other places of learning out with the school. So we've been able to enact that through these relationships with, with these guys. Thanks, Louise. Um, Stuart, anything you want to add in? I, I, I think the, the community thing is really, really important. And actually it's written in there into the curriculum in itself as well, in terms of the, the, we've, we've made a, um, a definition between physical education and physical activity and physical activity in the community and then we bring in wider achievement and things there as well I think it's about making sure you have the right partnerships the, the two things are inextricably linked um, but they are different as well and um, I think having coaches in is absolutely beneficial and um, we have um, four performance pathways so we get kids in an S1 we've never done rugby before we take them out of maths and English and get them to do rugby with a rugby coach. But we work with the rugby coach to make sure that that experience is backing onto the experience and outcomes and the, the benchmarks that want to deliver an S1. We're still delivering PE. And what we've then got is with our links in the community is we've then got a pathway that, that pu those pupils can carry that on all the way through school and then beyond school and into the community. We also then have the other arm of that um, community pathway where if we can engage kids in physical education that engages them and makes them really uh, excited about doing sport or find something that they really enjoy and gives them a passion they don't have to go on to be international players or club players but actually if they can then go into the community and work with some coaches that have been working within with them in the school they go out there and they take part in physical activity beyond school so it's imperative it has, absolutely is massively important um, but Thanks. it has to work with it. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks. That was really interesting. There's so many questions in the chat and I would love to stay in the chat more. And I've tried to get through as many as I can and do the best I can in cheering it. But we are going to have to move on because we're coming to a close. And I want to hand over to David because he's going to talk about our next event, which is looking at our with our Welsh colleagues from a Welsh perspective. So... Over to you, David. It's at this point I wish I could speak Welsh. My grandmother was Welsh, so I should really, but I'm going to pass. I can't, my Welsh is still, uh, does speak and write, so I'm still learning Welsh. Um, I'll have to go to Anna for some well, proper Welsh next time. I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, hopefully this goes okay. Um, do let me know if you can't see it. 
Can you see that, Nicola? You should be able to see the slides now. Can you see that? No, say that, Dave. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, here we go. Okay. How's that? Thanks, Jim. Okay. Um, so, big thank you for everyone coming along tonight, uh, and thank you for your patience from all of us who have coordinated the, the event tonight. Big thank you to Shirley for her patience as well. Um, funny enough, I'm reading a book about uh, stoic kind of activities and practices. I might add a chapter in on working with Zoom and Eventbrite into that one next time as well. So a big thank you to Shirley for all of the work in coordinating us and helping us through that process. Um, so just to say, um, if you have any further questions, I think the chat's fascinating um, about some of the questions and perspectives that are emerging through the, the excellent presentations this evening. Um, if you do have any further questions or ideas or thoughts or perspectives, our emails, our contact details are, are listed here. Um, so do get in touch. We we're always willing to have further discussions on those. Um, it would be great to see uh, educators from both countries having those conversations beyond things like Zoom. So that would be great. Um, so what are we going to be doing in March? So as Shirley said right at the start, the next event is in um, March on Thursday the 18th, 4 to 5.30 p.m. What we're going to be doing is something very, very similar um, to what's been going on tonight. So we're going to uh, outline the Welsh context for curriculum reform, but we're going to look at, as we have done tonight then, the possibilities for the repurposing of physical health education within the new Welsh curriculum framework. So we're going to do three things um, with my colleagues uh, Anna Bryan and um, educators who have been doing this process as well. First thing that we'll talk about is outlining the context and the structures of the new curriculum for Wales and what those structures offer in terms of the possibilities, as I talked about, for health and well-being and physical health education within schools and communities in Wales. Um, what's been really nice tonight is the sharing of experiences and different positions. Uh, so thanks again, uh, Stu and Louise, for that. And we're going to do a similar thing from um, a Welsh perspective as well. So some of the work that we've been doing at Cardiff Met for some time now has been working with our community and, and teachers at the classroom, why I say the coal face in kind of this anatomy of the curriculum. So we'll share some of their experiences and importantly, the positions they've had to negotiate and adopt in that kind of anatomy process. Uh, and the last thing that we'll wrap up with that then is discussing some of those implications for professional learning now and in the future. So interestingly on the chat, there's been a kind of vibe around professional learning changes to that kind of professional learning provision in terms of um, how we respond to the curriculum. Uh, and so we'll give some kind of examples of that work that we're doing in Wales, then also listen to some, have a nice discussion around some of those implications. Um, to get us going, uh, I was really fortunate in the summer to do a podcast for a colleague, Risto. Some of you might be following his um, podcast series anyway. I did say I'd give him a kind of nudge towards that podcast series. Um, but what we did in the summer was we outlined some of those kind of structures of the new Welsh curriculum there. So in preparation for March, if you wanted to have a listen to the, the podcast to get a flavour of what the new Welsh curriculum is and means in terms of our, our repositioning towards a health and wellbeing agenda, do have a listen to that. Um, we'll send out um, a separate Eventbrite invitation with a passcode, hopefully, next time um, on the, on the, for the next event, and we'll send that to the mailing list um, for the second webinar soon. If you know everyone, anyone who isn't here tonight or you want to spread the kind of message around the events that we've been coordinating, please do so as well. Um, but thank you again. Thank you on behalf of the, the team that's put that, this together. It's been really exciting um, doing that. And I've learned a lot um, through the process, both about digital technology and also then something around curriculum. So I'll hand over back to Nicola before we end tonight. Thanks, David. Thanks, and thanks for sharing that and uh, giving us a bit of a taster for the event in March. Shirley, are you there or are you